Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hope and Anchor Church. I hope that you've had a good, warm, uh, enjoyable week. I hope that uh, something inside of you has been preparing for this time together as we pray together, as we worship together, as we open God's word together, because this is an important uh, practice, an important moment uh, in the life of a believer, but also in the life of a church, uh, that we come together and, and we're recentered under the Lordship of Jesus together, because you know what's happening tomorrow, right? Well, Monday, you know, and Monday is going to be the start of a week that may be very much like some of the weeks that you've already been through. And um, we need all the grace, all the peace, all the encouragement of the spirit that we can get as we go into the week. Um, I'm loving this weather. Anyone else a winter fan? Man, would the Lord bring back good snow? It's been like a decade at least since we've had a decent snow around here. And I was so pumped about the idea of possibly getting snow, but uh, I don't know if we're going to get it. We're probably just going to get gray wet. That's kind of what we get instead now. So anyway... May the Lord look kindly on us and give us snow this winter. So. Anyway, uh, I pray that your preparations for Christmas uh, with family and friends are coming along. This is going to be a strange year, of course, but um, I pray that uh, in the midst of that, uh, we can meet uh, in meaningful ways with those we care about uh, as we worship, as we prepare for the arrival of our Lord Jesus Christ and then celebrate his coming to us. Um, we are in the uh, third week of Advent. Uh, in the keeping of the season of Advent, and this is the week of joy. And um, I have asked Kendall and Heather to come and lead us in our Advent readings. So will you please stand? In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one, who is God himself, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. <clears throat> we light the third candle of Advent. We look to John, the one you sent, to point us to your light. The light will come into our world and enlighten everyone. We have known people who have challenged us and called us into God's light. They seem, like John, called by God to prepare us for a deeper faith. We recall our need for you to send people into our lives, to challenge us, and to call us into deeper faith. God sent John the Baptizer to prepare the people for the coming of Jesus Christ, the true light of the world. John called for people to repent of their sins and to live faithfully. He baptized with a cleansing water and proclaimed the new life that Christ, the one who would follow him, would bring. This Advent, we ask for God's mercy and a joyful new beginning. Go for it. All right. <clears throat> Shine on us, O God of justice. Guide our path through gloom of night. Bear within us wisdom's glory. Come to us, O Christ the light. 
Merciful God, we give thanks that you send messengers like John to call us to greater trust and belief. We ask that in these days, we prepare for you in prayer and acts of holy compassion. Forgive us and lead us to your light. Amen. Good job. Thank you. You may be seated. Please stand and let's uh, pray and, and let's just be joyous about this season and, and what Christ has done for us. Uh, I have to think there's there's a lot of good Christian, sorry, Christmas songs out there, um, but none of them really... The joyous ones didn't have a lot of like worship feel to me, so just uh, sing those you know on your way home. But we're gonna do some just good worship songs, and they're all about what Christ has done for us and that eternal joy that we can have because of that. So.
as, yeah. So we'll start over, I guess. Um, I'm Curtis, and this is Kendi, my wife. Uh, we have the privilege of working with the students here. Um, it, is, it is a great privilege. Um, I, we've been doing it for what, five, four or five years? I don't know. Seems, seems like forever. Um, but I don't, I don't know if you guys know this, but we've been blessed with wonderful students. I mean, I, I know you guys have your kids here, but um, they do great things. Uh, from, the, from the decorations that you see up on the stage today to running our sound and PowerPoint, thank you guys back there, um, to putting on dances. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, uh, for those that didn't know, last night they had a wonderful time coming together. Um, and, and my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, because I wasn't here, I, was ha I had to work, was there was a lot of ladies dancing and a few fellas, right? It was all very modest. I modest, yes. okay. Lots of group dancing, lots of guys hiding in the basement, pretty much. Right. Yeah, that's, that's how it went last night. It was, right. it was fun. Heather and I were here. It was a good time. Yeah. So um, thank you for all that, that participated and helped out. Um, we, are, we are truly blessed. Uh, one of the other roles here is, yes, I'll sit, um, <laughs> is, is that we are blessed to be a part of the elder team here at Hope and Anchor. Um, it, it is a, a joy and honor uh, to be, um, be there available for you guys and to support. And one of the things that I'm not crazy about when you look at the elder thing is, is teaching. I love teaching to students. You guys are nerve wracking to me. So I'm gonna admit <laughs> it, it's a little nervous. Uh, and, and so if I stumble over words or we have to restart four or five times, please bear with me. Um, but before we get any further, one, one of the things I, I did wanna talk about before we pray is I didn't know this. I, I recently learned that today, being the third week, the, the pink candle stands is, is representative of this shepherd candle, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I, I don't know if you planned it or not, um, <laughs> but it kind of all worked together because that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we get any further, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that, that you will hopefully speak through us. Um, God, more importantly, speak to us today. Father, I ask, Lord, that you will just use this time to, to maybe reunite our hearts with you, um, spark new ideas, new passion, um, and let your word speak forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So are we going to try this, or am I just putting it away? Am I there? Yep. You yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so, in preparation for this, uh, I always like to go to our friend N.T. Wright. We like to use in our uh, student studies, our, um, the kind of study guides that they have, or that he has on all the different books of the Bible. So, um, the one that he has for the book of Luke starts with this fun little anecdote, so I thought I'd read it to you guys. Um, so, it's in N.T. Wright's Bible for Everyone's Study Guide. Uh, he opens his study with this. Uh, if you try to point out something to a dog, the dog will often look at your finger instead of the object you're trying to point to. This is frustrating, but it illustrates a natural mistake we all make from time to time. It's the mistake many people make when reading the Christmas story in Luke's Gospel, focusing on the manger, the Christmas crib, the most famous animal feeding trough in all history. To concentrate on the manger and to forget why it was mentioned in the first place is like the dog looking at the finger rather than the object. I'm not trying to call you all dogs, I promise, um, but that's kind of where we're trying to focus in. Uh, the point Luke is making is clear. The birth of this little boy is the beginning of a confrontation between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. Augustus never heard of Jesus of Nazareth, but within a century or so, his successors in Rome had not only heard of him, they were taking steps to obliterate his followers. Just over three, three centuries later, a Roman emperor became a Christian. Luke's narrative reminds us not to stop at the manger, but to see the explosive truth it's pointing to. So as, as we look at the, today, we're going to be looking in Luke 2. Uh, we're going to start in verse 8. But some backstory, a little bit of knowing what shepherds. I think we get this idea that shepherds, well, I, I have a picture. We don't have it here today. But it was basically, I think Megan was doing the children's way back in the day. And we've got Atticus <laughs> in a robe waving. 
Uh, and, and so we kind of get this idea that, you know, we've, we've got good shepherds. We, we heard about that today from even Santa Claus that, that, uh, with the candy canes, uh, that Jesus was the good shepherd. But I, I think what's important to know is some, some facts of what shepherds look like at this time. Um, so we have back in the day with, you know, Moses and David, this was considered an honorable position. But by the time that Jesus came around, this was kind of a... These, these are rough guys. Uh, probably the nearest comparison I could put in my head uh, when we were working on this was kind of how some of us grew up with cowboys, and, and they were kind of rough, tough guys, right? We, we watched westerns, and, and I used to have a horse uh, that was a tree. Uh, I would sit in this tree and, and shoot the, the bad guys, um, but it was all about being kind of rough and tough. Um, by this time, these uh, shepherds were considered of ill repute. Um, so the reputations were, were kind of rough. They were known as thieves. They were often put into the same standard as the tax collectors and the lepers. Um, and so uh, some other things to consider is uh, they, were, they were considered uh, ritually unclean uh, because they were dealing with their animals. Um, they weren't allowed to testify in court proceedings. Uh, in the Meshna, uh, which is a, a Jewish written, like the first written um, oral from the oral law, the record of the oral law, um, they were considered incompetent, and um, they were often viewed as people. If they fell in a hole, they were not to be rescued. Yeah. So that was kind of the standard. Um, yeah, so they were not considered good guys by any means. Um, so for background purposes, we've got shepherds, and then I'm going to talk to you about angels, because that was what we were assigned to today, shepherds and angels. Um, so biblically, uh, the angels have a lot going on. Um, they were created and commanded by God. Uh, God's messengers, um, so we have stories from the Old Testament where angels were sent to speak to um, Daniel specifically is what I'm thinking of. Uh, and then we've also heard about the angels speaking to Mary and Joseph as well. Um, they are mighty beings that fight against evil. They are powerful, innumerable, humble servants and model humility, joy, obedience, and worship. So for us as believers, um, looking to the angels and, and how they reflect um, how they're created, who they are, and um, how they worship God um, is, is given to us uh, as modeling for us. Um, and some uh, different, I just kind of want to give you some background here too. So on Mount Sinai, God came um, from ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. So in Deuteronomy, uh, we also learn that chariots of God were tens of thousands and thousands and thousands. That just gives us that innumerable uh, idea that we're looking for here uh, when we jump into Luke 2. Because we're, we're going to be looking at kind of how these two parties came together, how the shepherds that were so um, ostracized and these angels that are so innumerable came together on that particular night. Uh, so when it comes to worship, we come into the presence of innumerable angels in Hebrews 12. Uh, John says, I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders with voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands. Every biblical reference to the total number of angels suggests that they're beyond counting. Um, so angels also, like I said, model worship, uh, and so it's up to us to kind of do that as well. So leading into another story we've got from N.T. Wright uh, on his sermon from the shepherds at midnight. I'm just going to read the kind of first little bit of this to kind of set the stage for Luke 2. All right. So the choir had been practicing for hours, and the singers were tired, but the conductor kept them at it. This was the most amazing music they, had ever, they were ever going to sing, and they were only going to get one chance at it. Had to be right the first time. Finally, they were there. One last run through, and it was perfect. But, but one of the singers asked a question. How come we only get to sing this once? This is fantastic music. Wouldn't it be better if we could give several performances in different places to different audiences? No, replied the conductor. This music is for a very special occasion. It's only to be sung the once, at least by you. Once you've done that, the people who, who've heard it will have, to sing, will have to learn to sing it for themselves. 
The conductor was God himself, and the singers were the angels. The audience were the shepherds, and through them, everyone who heard, and through them, everyone who heard it. And the special occasion is the birth of God's own son. So we're going to go ahead and read Luke 2, 2 through 20, or I'm sorry, 8 through 20. Let me get my Bible. Here, hold this for a second. All right. So, and there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they, turned, they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all, all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. As we look a little deeper into this, I, I, I have been guilty. I don't know if you guys have been, but I think the nativity story is often one of those that we, we kind of overlook a lot of importance. Um, you know, all the, all the things that had to happen for this to come about, you know, um, and, and so I struggled, you know, for weeks I struggled with, okay, an, uh, I get the angels is, are important, but the shepherds, why are they important? You know, and, and I, I asked people and I was like researching and, and one of the things that I, I couldn't come to was there wasn't anything real significant about them, right? We don't even get their names. Right? It's just, we, we've got this passage and, and there's no, no real else there. So I started asking, what can we learn from this? What can we take with this? Um, and, and what we see here in the first, you know, uh, 8 through 14 is there's a true encounter. Mm -hmm. Right? So we have the encounter with the angels. And, and what better way for, for God to... For God to speak his message than a group of people that don't fit, that, that, that nobody else would have considered valuable, mm -hmm. nobody else would have considered um, worthy to, to, to have anything uh, spiritual done for them. Uh, and I think that's the first key, is this, this encounter was a true encounter with, with the angels, I think is important, and it came in as a booming message, right, that kind of resounded through um, that God was giving the same message throughout the, the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus is that Jesus came for all. Mm -hmm. I think that's the very first thing. But, but I, I, I don't know if the shepherds would have walked away if it was just the angels, right? I, 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 now, you and I, we might, we might have rationalized if we had just had an encounter with just a group of angels yelling at us, uh, <laughs> singing at us, we might have, man, I, I don't know, our wine sacks had kind of went bad or, or, or whatever, but we could have probably rationalized, right? But then the second piece there is there was evidence, right? So what did they do? They went and checked it out, right? But I think the true encounter we see there is they saw Jesus, mm -hmm. right? And, and so a lot of times when we're, when we're going through our faith, we need to have those true encounters with God. Um, there, there's there's going to be that evidence. There's going to be that reassurance that happens. The, the, uh, when we look in later on with uh, Mary, the, the third thing we see is encouraging. That this story is encouraging to Mary, right? That's, that's something that, you know, when we watch... Um, Oh, Charlie Brown back in the day, um, that was one of those things we kind of leave off, right? We leave off the, the fact that he went to go, the shepherds went to go see Jesus, and then what happened afterwards. Um, so we've got um, that this was an encouragement to Mary. 
you just had a baby. The, the, you're, 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 you're dealing with this kind of a emotional, uh, you know, we've got the issue with, you know, is, is Mary telling the truth? I mean, there's all sorts of stories that are go probably going around about what happened to her. Um, and, and so what we see is that, that these guys came as an encouragement. And we can be that way when we're having our real encounters with others. We never know when we're sharing about what's going on uh, in our relationship with, with Jesus, how that affects somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it says that Mary treasured these things up. I think that's important. Um, and, and the last thing is we, we see that the, the angel, or I'm sorry, the, the shepherds, um, they, they were engaged at that moment, right? So when we're in our faith and we've got those, those moments where we've had true encounter and we've had evidence and we've, we've been encouraged or encouraged others and both, the, the next thing is there needs to be action. There needs to be engagement that happens, right? So what did they do? What did the, the shepherds do? They went and spoke to everybody that would listen, right? And, and these are guys that nobody probably wanted to listen to, but they didn't care, mm -hmm. right? Um, they wanted to pass on this. And then the, the last thing is they didn't go back to, I guess one of the things is they did leave their sheep. They forgot all about their sheep <laughs> in this process, right? But they didn't go necessarily back and do the things they did before. Right? What did it say in the, the last part? It says that they went back rejoicing and glorifying and praising God for what they had seen. And I think that's, when I, when I look at the big idea, I think there's definitely moments where we have these, these booming message encounters with God. And, and I think those are going to be life-changing moments, but I think it's also important to understand that there's those quiet times. There's those times that you're, you're, you're being still, um, you know. I, I, so, I mean, so the, what is the big idea? Um, it says, God brings the good news to all, even the despised, the broken, and devalued. The glory of the Lord is powerful and huge. Just because we don't see the way we expect to see it. Uh, doesn't mean that God is inactive. We often, he often works in quiet ways. Only usually does he confirm his presence in big, booming, miraculous ways. So, um, we talked through, what did we talk through? Encounter, right? Um, what were the encounter evidence. speak to me evidence encouragement and engagement so so what do we do with that where do we take that what do we do next right um, Curtis was kind of teasing me earlier this week because I teach uh, to adults all the time but in a different way and I ask a lot of questions he's like you can't just ask questions they're all just gonna stare at you I'm like okay fine um, but but what are we going to do with that so my job at the end of this is to kind of challenge you all so the challenge this week um, is to look for Jesus in the quiet places of your life. So looking for that encounter, looking for that small miracle. Kurt, you used to do, what were they called? Small, mir small miracles. Okay. Um, it was before we got together and he was doing youth ministry stuff 20 years ago. Um, he would have, you know, the kids come back and talk about small miracles in their life every week. Uh, and, and sometimes they were just sort of, you know, I woke up on time every day this week, like high five. Um, but others were these huge deals that would happen. And so um, the challenge for you this week from us is to to look for those things, too. Like we have obviously the shepherds have this huge encounter with angels and Jesus and Mary and, and everything that was happening. Um, but we want you to look for those those quiet things too, those those small things, um, those things that you can hold in your heart like Mary, right? So that when people are coming and encouraging you in those things, um, reflect on those things, store them in your heart, but also remember to share that experience, just like the shepherds did. Um, they, I don't know if they really realized what their life was like in that time, like if they were like, we're just the outcasts, nobody wants to listen to us. I don't know if they were super reflective, but, um, we want you to to know that there's always going to be somebody in your life that your story is going to affect them. Your story is going to change them. Um, and the shepherds, they didn't care who they talked to. They were just excited that they, they had this experience and that they saw um, what was happening and they had to tell everybody that they knew. 
Um, so reflect on those small miracles um, so that the good news can be shown uh, to the world through your own life, um, just like the shepherds. Thank you, Curtis and Kendi. Uh, let's pray together. Father, I pray that we would, uh, as we open your word, open up our hearts too, because uh, there is a danger in stories like uh, the Christmas story we find in scripture, that it becomes too familiar. Mm -hmm. And we start to not hear it in all of its wonder and weirdness. Um, I pray that we would understand how, how <laughs> shocking the angels lighting up the sky with their songs over the heads of these shepherds was. God, I pray that we too would be shocked and motivated to go and to see what it is God is doing among us and then go and to tell and to praise you for it. God, I pray that you would work that truth uh, during this Advent season uh, into our heart in a fresh way, in a new way, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So one thing I love about that story is that, uh, uh, you know, as someone who chooses to follow Christ, is to be someone who uh, is aware of and engaging into the, the, the practice of your faith. You're entering into this spiritual space, which has been oftentimes called a, a thin place. It's a thin place. It's a, it's a thin space between our, our place and, and God's place. And, and what we're doing like on Sunday morning is that's coming very, very close. And while that may feel warm and inviting, that can also feel pretty terrifying. terrifying. It's a big collision that happens when we're confronted with the reality of God in our reality. It's like, whoa, woe is me. That's actually biblical language. Whoa, woe is me. Uh, this is why the angels say things like, chill. <laughs> Don't be afraid, you know. Um, and it's so ironic. I mean, uh, the, the image that comes to mind, I mean, because the angels like lighting up the sky, it's the most overwhelming show of God's uh, announcement in the most underwhelming way to the most underwhelming people, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like the Broadway production of Cats, you know, being shown for the first time and they decide to do it in Blue Eye, Missouri. <laughs> Or, or Bolivar, or somewhere, you know, I mean, it's like, whoa, this is like world-class. Sorry, Bolivar, that's offensive, I'm sure. But, uh, but you know what I mean? It's like this huge, like, best-in-the-world production coming to, like, Dubuque, Iowa, or something. Like, well, this is like a mismatch. Well, there is a mismatch here, it seems. But God knew exactly what he was doing. A couple weeks ago, Sue and Dale, they talked about the manger. Like, God's like, hey, send Jesus, and we'll send him in a food trough. I wonder if any of the angels were like, run that bias one more time. <laughs> food trough, okay. I'm tracking, I'm tracking. Food, food trough, okay. <laughs> so anyway, there's so much about the Christmas story that's unexpected, and I love how you guys brought that out today. I mean, the reality of God coming into our reality and just blowing our minds. I mean, God really came in to change things from the bottom up, mm -hmm. from the inside out, and uh, I love that about God and his heart. So thank you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Grady's like, oh, a squirrel. <laughs> Join me in our Advent prayers. With joy and gratitude, let us pray to the Lord that our Christmas preparations will proclaim the joy of the Savior. We pray to the Lord. That the gifts we exchange this Christmas will include gifts of love and understanding. We pray to the Lord. That God will bless those who receive our gifts and greetings in the days ahead, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us now offer the prayer Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father of all, so great is your love for us that you gave us the gift of your Son. He healed our infirmities, forgave our shortcomings, and showed us the way to you. May we always know the joy and hope of his presence among us. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and brother. Amen. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all wisdom, all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with, thanks, with thankful hearts. 
And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And now may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thank you. Have a good snowy afternoon.